hear from God's heart today, I invite you to that passage read a moment ago in the third chapter of Proverbs, where we are in our seventh week of the summer teaching series, Say Yes to God. We're discovering that a very clear way we say yes to God is by aligning our lives with His truth. Now, there's a seventh way that we can say yes to God, and that is by not giving up on His will and His way. Did you notice there's a theme throughout the time of praise and worship, and that theme was God's perspective through the eyes of Christ, following Him by day and night. Our calling is to get right behind where God is leading and to know His way and His will for our lives. Easier said than done. Would you agree? To always know this is God's way, this is God's will. Uh, the topic of, of God's way for, for our lives is not something to be presumed upon by our simple familiarity with with how God leads. We need to understand when God is speaking and directing that our calling is to be right in the midst of, of where he's leading. The safest place in the world is to be in the center of God's will for you and for me. Would you agree with that? that regardless of where that will takes us, the safest place is to be in the center uh, of his will. Uh, Martin Luther wrote a devotional once titled, Day by Day We Magnify Thee. In that devotional, he commented on the will of God, and this is what he wrote. God has given neither you nor anyone your own will. For man's own will comes from the devil and from Adam. Many make the free will God has given us to be transformed into our own will. This is the dilemma of every believer. How can we truly discern between God's will and what we might think is His will, our own way and our own purposes? Maybe this story will help. I, I was reading about an immigrant who came to the United States in 1958. He came from Germany, and he wrote this about his voyage. Every day for four days, I awakened on the vessel and looked out, and all I could see were giant waves, and all I could hear was the groaning of the ship's engine. It was this way day after day until that final moment where I stood on the bow of the ship and I could see the tip of the Statue of Liberty. And I knew that the plan had been accomplished. But he doesn't stop there. Helmer Heckel writes this. My journey to the U.S. reminds me of something more important, how every Christian journeys in God's plan for his purpose and will. And there are days, he writes, when we feel that living by faith offers us nothing but but giant waves and the groaning sound of daily life. But eventually, if we stay faithful, we will wake up and on the horizon, we will see that we had been in God's purpose all along. What we find here is the truth that discovering God's way and will is a journey and a process, not some quick, immediate awakening. So God's people have before us the call to Never give up on God's will and God's way. This is yet another expression of how we say yes to God. By resolving that, God, I'll never give up on your will and your way for me. I'll stay faithful and trust you until you fulfill that perfect plan. Maybe, just maybe, there's some of us who've grown discouraged concerning God's will and way because perhaps... What you have hoped for and dreamed for is simply not unfolding as fast as you would desire. Maybe there are those occasions where we find ourselves yearning for God to take us to that port quickly, the port of His will and His purpose. I think what the Holy Spirit teaches us through God's Word is that if, if we will stay focused on who God is and how He's leading our lives daily, then we can know we are in His way. And we're in his will. Let's not confuse our will with his. Because man's fleshly will can only come from, from the devil himself or from, from Adam as Martin Luther describes it. Oh, our calling is to know, God, what are you planning? What is your will? What is your way? How can we stay focused on God's way 
for our lives. You know, Isaiah chapter 55, verse 8 tells us that God's ways are not ours. So we know there's a calling to distinguish, to delineate out what is our way and to see God's way for us. While this may sound so simple, the calling is strong that you and I would not be diverted daily to our own ways, but that we would truly know God's way for our lives. When I look at these verses before us, there seems to be very clear indications that a part of what God was to accomplish in his people through the writing of Solomon here was to understand that God's wisdom always leads to you and I understanding his very practical way. Well, I love how in, in verse 19 through 20, we saw that the wisdom of God was manifest in and what God created, demonstrating that we can trust God's wisdom because we can trust God. And then as we turn into verse 21 and following, this idea of way continues to surface. We read that, that we would learn to walk in, in our way securely and that we would understand how God would keep our feet from slipping in the way. And so God's wisdom always leads to you and I practically getting in God's direction and knowing his way in fact if we could begin at verse 21 i'd like to build with you from the scripture a list of seven steps to take so that you and i may not give up on god's way and god's will for our lives look at verse 21 my son let not these things vanish from your sight keep sound wisdom and discretion the first step we want to take to not give up on god's way to stay in his way is this be vigilant with god's truth keep your eyes upon the truth of god daily and regularly i just completed a road trip with my daughters now before you think that sounds glamorous it was 21 hours of driving to Texas to get middle daughter back into school. And this is what we did for 21 hours. So nothing glamorous about this road trip. After the first several hours, we then switched things up and did this. But we were still sitting and driving again and again. But I noticed something in, in this laborious trip. There was a GPS that I had to rely upon because although I've made this trip hundreds of times, in fact, someone said, you get a little break. You don't have to move another child in until Sarah Joy is in college. Let me assure you, by then, we'll be calling someone else to move all the stuff up the steps. Uh, we're driving, and, and I know this trip well, but, but if I were to take my eyes off the GPS, you know what I would miss? I would miss that there is a part of I-20 in Birmingham, Alabama that is totally closed. And if I were not watching, I would have been rerouted through downtown Birmingham, and with a trailer, that's not a very comfortable place to be. Regardless of how familiar you and I may think we are to what God has been saying, we are called in verse 21 to keep a vigilant look upon his truth. This is what Solomon is telling his son, both literally and spiritually. Be vigilant. Do not take your eyes off of the truth of God. He summarizes the truth of God with these words, wisdom and, and discretion. But these words in their particularity summarizes all of what chapter 3 has said thus far. The wisdom and the word of God must be before us always. We must diligently and keep them in our sight. I love the metaphor of the sensory, which complements another expression of sensory in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 20. My son, give ear to my sayings. This is a compliment for the sensory demonstrations serve as a metaphor for how we should stay truly focused and intent on what God is saying. Be vigilant to hear him to to understand what he is saying and i i think there's a new testament principle here we cannot dismiss paul once prayed for the ephesian church that the eyes notice the sensory image that the eyes of their heart would be open what's being championed there and here in this verse 
is a perception, a spiritual awareness of what God is saying. And then to be so vigilant with the fact that it is God who speaks his truth. And this is Solomon's heart for his son and foreshadowing the people of God. This is God's heart for us that we would be vigilant with our eyes, our soul eyes, the eyes of our heart, the deepest part of our being that we would stay focused upon what God is saying. Now there's a danger here when we hear receive this statement, hey, daily, <laughs> with practice, much like Psalm uh, 119, 115. Let the word of God be a lamp to your feet and a light to your path. Daily stay focused. There is a danger here. The danger is that you and I would become rote in our approach to God's word, that we would approach God's word so habitually that it simply becomes a practice and not an encounter with God's truth. Uh, this is a danger. I, I remember in Isaiah chapter 28, verse 13, the people of God were actually mocking the prophet when he would speak God's word. And they would become indifferent. The, these, these are members of Judah. They would become indifferent to what Isaiah was saying. And Isaiah chapter 28, verse 13, has the, the reality of God's people hearing his word as line upon line upon line with no meaning. No application. It was all function. There was uh, the captivity of activity. The word of God was being dismissed, yet still practiced in routine. There were, there were uh, statements uh, and practices of being open to the word of God, but in the heart, the people of God were mocking the prophet because they had thought, we don't need to hear this. There is a danger in simply treating the word of God as something that is practiced as a document, this is life. This is wisdom. This is God's heart for his people, and we must keep our eyes upon the truth. I love that these verses of, of turning our attention to God's truth so that it becomes a practical part of our lives. It mirrors verse 19 through 20 again, because God is the creator of all things, and his glory has resonated through creation because he has made all things by his wisdom. So when we look at the wisdom of God, we're seeing truth. When we look in God's scripture, we're seeing truth that reflects the glory of God and the glory of Christ. There is a relationship behind the truth. And the relationship is a God who has made his glory known, according to 2 Corinthians 4, 6, through the face of Christ. So when we come to the scripture, we know that Christ is the Logos. He's the word. He's the demonstration of God. And when we see the truth of God, oh, our motivation should be, I, I can't take my eyes off of it. Because his truth is life. And this is the message of verse 21. Have you ever seen a young couple in love? One just can't take their eyes off the other and they hear everything. The other person says, a, a, a young lady who had been married to her husband for just months the other day said, Pastor Ken, I, I hang on his every word. And I looked at him and winked and said, you need to enjoy that right now. You really do. I, you know, th this is utopia. You know, check in and stay as long as you can. We hang on to the words of those with whom we love deeply. That's the message here. Do you love your God? Do you honor Jesus Christ? Then vigilantly keep your eyes on his truth. That's the first step. And making absolutely certain that we're not giving up on God's way. This gives us then the spirit of esteeming or honoring the word of God in our hearts. So a second step toward never giving up on God's will and way is to esteem God's word. Look at verse 22. Oh, his precepts, his wisdom, his discretion, all that involves his truth, they will be life to your soul and an adornment to your neck. Yes, we want to be regular in keeping our eyes on the word of God, but please don't do that without esteeming the word of God. This was Israel's plight that Isaiah dealt with. They were practicing the word of God with no honor for what God was saying. Look at how the picture of honoring God's word is described in verse 22. His precepts will be life to your soul. Oh, that's a non-tangible but a very real picture 
that his scripture, his truth should affect us deeply because we love him. We should hang on his every word. But look at the tangible description of verse 22. Uh, they will adorn your neck. This reminds me of the beginning of Proverbs chapter 3, verse 3, when, when we read, bind his word around your neck. Well, certainly there's reference to the historical phylactery that would be worn on the forehead with, with uh, copies of God's uh, word from the Torah therein. But, but more significantly, the neck is displayed here as holding something dear to the heart. When you read, oh, that they would adorn your neck you're actually reading that they would grace your neck my my wife has has a ring that that has a beautiful uh, jewels on it and and uh, part of it is is earrings from her her mother that she had solder on there and and when you ask her about that ring uh, every piece of it is an heirloom and she she holds it dear and that provides the perfect imagery of verse 22, adorn God's word, esteem his word close to your heart. Oh, I love Psalm 119, verse 48. The psalmist said, I, I, I raise my hand to be committed to your word that I love. Practice should never be absent of passion. The psalmist said, God, I love your truth, not because I'm worshiping the word, but because there in your truth is the foreshadowing of the Christ, the truth of life. Life itself is found in what you say. So, God, I esteem your word. Do you esteem the word of God? Has it become nothing more than a page on a devotional calendar? Or do you see that the word of God is the correspondence from the heart of your Abba Father, to you, this is a beautiful picture. Esteem the word of God. So, so we keep our eyes on it daily. We esteem, knowing that God is, is the Abba behind his word. Jesus is the life of the word. So we treat it as, as that which is bound to our neck, but speaks of the, of the influence in our soul. And then here's the third step, verse 23. Then you will walk in your way securely, and your foot will not stumble. Daily depend upon God's direction. I know this sounds very simple and maybe for many too primary of a truth. But consider the context. Notice that after this call to esteem the truth, after this call to daily observe and view, oh, we are to walk in that way so that we will walk securely. Verse 21 is causation. Why do you look at the, the scripture? Why are you esteeming it? Verse 23, so that you can walk in, in, in your way securely. Incidentally, the phrase your way actually references the normal responsibilities of life. That is what would be translated from the Hebrew culture in the phrase your ways. So your normal responsibilities and your normal obligations might even be the stronger word here. They become something that is set so that in them you are secure from day to day. Herein lies the imagery of depending upon what God is saying, even for our daily obligations. Most of us have daily routines of which we are so familiar we could make drives, we could answer phone calls, we could, we could interact with people almost as a second nature. Solomon warns us in a loving way, depend upon God for your daily obligations, for your way. So then your feet will be secure. I love that imagery. Your, your foot will not stumble. You'll be secure. But wherever there may be an, an uneasy pass before you, realize God's way is vital, which reflects his will for you. He knows what the other side of your impasse looks like. He knows the plan to get you there. We, we follow his way by keeping our eyes on his truth, by esteeming his truth, so we're not caught in rote memory, but we're truly engaging with what he has said through our relationship with Christ. And then we depend upon 
his truth with our, our daily lives. This is how we navigate toward his will, by daily aligning ourselves with, with what he is saying for our particular moment. Again, discovering God's way and will is not a, a magical immediate revelation. It is a journey and a process of daily understanding, God, how do you want me to act in this moment right now? There are so many that are play, praying for God's will to be enfolded on the horizon when what he probably is looking for most of the time is asking God, what is your will right now? In this situation in the office, in this relationship at home, what do you want of me right now? And when your eyes are kept on the word of God and you're esteeming his word and you apply that truth to daily life and daily obligations, then you're inching and moving closer to his way and his will. Daily depend upon God's direction. Don't be like Jehoshaphat. Do you know what King Jehoshaphat did? You're probably thinking Jehoshaphat who? Well, well King Jehoshaphat, uh, uh, Second Chronicles chapter 20, uh, uh, was going before God and asking God for his intervention with Judah's enemies. This is a huge piece of, of his role as, as leading God's people. But if you look at the whole profile of Jehoshaphat, while he was attempting to surrender all of God's well-being before God himself, as they were about to enter into combat with, with pagan nations, he had let his guard down with issues in his own family by honoring his daughter's marriage to a pagan king. So while, quote-unquote, the bigger decisions were being surrendered to the Lord, there were, in his mind, smaller decisions he decided he would handle on his own. Always, even as proven in Jehoshaphat's life, always, even though the bigger decisions might be something we're surrendering to God, if we're not checking ourselves with those daily steps and decisions, they will undo anything that we believe God may have set up in our life. Be careful of just waving past those daily decisions, but instead, take all of our daily obligations and say, God, what will you have of me to do in these situations? Trusting what you see in his word, trusting in the relationship when he makes his word known to you, and then applying that truth to our daily obligations is a huge step toward understanding God's way and God's will. But consider this. When you begin reading in verse 24, there is a description of rest. And I love this. Because how can we know we're daily depending upon God in our moment-by-moment -moment journeys? How can we know we're not handling the small decisions ourselves while surrendering the big things to God? We know this with this measurement of rest. Do you hear verse 24? When you lie down at night, you'll not be afraid. When you lie down, your sleep will be sweet. How does that sound? Now, I'm going to tell you, my sleep last night was very abbreviated, but very sweet because I was pooped. That's why I was very tired. Our culture tends to champion a nice sleep as a mode of recovery. But in Scripture, rest and sleepfulness represents more than just recovering from fatigue. It represents tranquility and solitude and a true spiritual restfulness before God. And so another step we take toward truly being in God's will and way is to rest in what God has said. Uh, listen to verse 24. When you lie down, you'll not be afraid. Why will you not be afraid? And when you sleep, your sleep will be very sweet. Why is this? Because of verse 21 through 23. You've kept your eyes on God's word. You've stayed focused on what he has said. You're surrendering your daily agenda to what he has said. And even though you may not know the outcome of certain impasses in life, you are saying, God, this has got to be done your way. I am waiting and resting that your truth will make this situation perfect in your eyes. Well, there's a sweet rest when we know, God, you've got this. You have said this. You've declared this. And God, I'm aligning my heart with your word. I trust that what you promise 
will be fulfilled. That is sweet rest, even when you can't close your eyes. That is sweet rest. To say, God, according to what you've promised, you've got this. This is yours. And I rest in that fact. I, I love Psalm 63. One of the verses there declares that our faith is like a watchman. I will be like a watchman all night. And I will rest, says the psalmist, because God, I know you'll fulfill your way. So rest in what God has said. How do I know God's going to take me through this moment or, or, or take my family through this encounter? Uh, what he has said he'll do. Rest in his truth. Rest in his wisdom. Rest in, in his way. And that's a beautiful, beautiful step toward understanding and living in God's way and God's will. When we do this, we see the development of this fifth step Peace. Take peace from God's rule. Listen to verse 25. Don't be afraid of sudden fear. You know, the onslaught of the wicked when it comes. There's nothing to fear. Solomon writes and teaches. This word, uh, onslaught, according to the New American Standard, is a word that indicates an overwhelmingness that is usually due to the wicked when they have made their path and they suffer the consequences thereof. But the, the imagery is actually of something that comes to you suddenly. This verse gives a picture of God's rule and sovereignty because of the suddenness and the unexpectedness of challenges that, that our life brings. A friend of mine and I were uh, scuba diving recently, and when we went down in the water... The sky was beautiful. It was great. It was the most perfect day, and we were not down that long. When we came up, the first thing we saw were the eyes of the people on the boat, and they were eyes of concern because this storm had come up quickly. And when we were looking back toward the coast of Virginia Beach and the beautiful sky, uh, we felt calm. But coming back up just minutes later, there had been this sudden development, which I am now learning is very common here, this sudden development of a storm front, and we were... We were, we were in, in harm's way, but, but even then, calm came because you could look at the satellite the captain was using. You could see the calm on the captain's face, realizing, well, yeah, this storm is sudden, but if we navigate here, uh, it, it won't touch us. And, and I'm looking at that and being reminded that you and I face things all the time that are unexpected and sudden. Diagnosis relationship death itself at times can be unannounced and sudden and even in that moment we take peace why because God's sovereignty is in place uh, when life is is totally out of place he's in control take fear Solomon writes uh, take courage he writes over sudden fear and over the onslaught that can develop quickly we take peace from God's rule. Why is this so important? Because the factor of peace is trust. We are trusting in the God who is in control. Do you remember in John chapter 10, verse 27, Jesus said the sheep will know the voice of the shepherd. Do you remember that? Uh, please don't read that without verse 26 because that gives you the full context. Verse 26 says this, because you're my sheep, you believe in me. And because you believe in me, when you hear my voice, you'll know it's me. And for the child of God, when something sudden comes up, you know and you believe that Jesus is at the satellite. He's at the wheel. He has already made a way. And when he speaks, you begin trusting his voice and following his inclinations. Why? Because in the midst of a sudden fear, the shepherd is still there. And that is exactly what Solomon's reminding us of. Don't be afraid. Because God's guidance, his presence is very real. Now this brings us to a final step that I'm so excited about. Live in the confidence of what God will say next. Listen to verse 26. So the Lord will be your confidence. Isn't that a great statement? 
God is your confidence. God, according to this word confidence, is your strength. He is your strength, your confidence, and he'll keep you and your foot from being caught. Uh, the enemy, Satan, is like a trapper with a snare, seeking to see God's people trip in their faith and to doubt God and to begin living in fear. And verse 26 reminds us God actually has a snare for that. God is going to snare your fears. They'll not bother you. He'll be your confidence. I'm looking at this word confidence in the original language. You'll find it interesting, as I did, that this word confidence can actually mean something that represents strength, or on the other end, the same word can also represent folly. So I began looking at this. How can one word have such a diverse meaning? And, and here's the message. In the midst of trouble, in the midst of challenges, in the midst of life, especially when there is a snare, something coming against your faith, it seems folly to say, I am not worried. God's got this. But the folly is actually confidence because you know that what God has said, what he has declared, and what he will declare can be trusted. So live in the confidence of what God will say next. You may not know what God will say next. You may not know what will be around the next turn of your life. I certainly don't. I have ideas. I have thoughts. But I really don't know what will come next. But we can trust God for what he will say and what he will do next. Don't allow anxieties to dictate what you'll decide right now. Don't allow the unknown around the next bend to cause your faith to become unsettled. Because God's there. He's navigating your life. You can trust completely what he will say and do next. I find this final step to be the most encouraging for me in my own life when I'm desiring to keep my eyes on God's way and God's will. Whatever he says next, I can trust it. You know, sometimes we're a little impatient with God, and we might, in our own minds, manufacture our own thoughts with God's label. I'm sure no one else has done that but me. But we manufacture our own thoughts because at least knowing something gives us a little bit of solitude. And then we say, well, God, that must have come from you because it's here and I needed it. No, not necessarily. Wait on God. You can trust what he'll say. He's, he's practically clearing his throat to speak into your life that truth that you need. He'll use a minister. He'll use his word. He'll use his Holy Spirit. He'll use a friend. He'll use a song. He'll use your time daily before the Lord with a devotional heart to seek him. But however he chooses to speak to your heart, you can trust what he'll say next. You can trust him. These are steps God has taught me in my own life. I share them with you this morning under this one simple way of saying yes to God. Not giving up on his will and his way. And the very practice of not giving up is by saying, God, my eyes are on your truth. I esteem your word. I depend on it for my daily decisions. I rest in what you've already said. I take peace from your rule, and I have confidence in what you will say. And I find that when I'm aligning myself to these truths from God's heart, His, His will and His way is on the horizon. You see it. Sometimes you don't know you're in the right way because the waves and the grinding of the vessel's engine. But if you and I will keep our focus upon what God has said and what he will say, you'll be in his will. You'll be in his way. And that is a beautiful expression of saying yes to God. Amen, church? I want to pray for you.